This isn't in my notes. I just want to read this to you this morning. As you think about, but it does tie into what I'm about to talk about. So, but I, I just, I, it was pressed on me so hard on, at 9 a.m. and I didn't do it. I stick to my script and I just really feel, I just want to share this. We, do we understand when we sing that song forever what we're joining with in heaven? Because it really has everything to do with what we're talking about. In the book of Revelation, uh, John sees, sees this vision and he sees a great multitude of every nation and, and while he's, before he sees them, he's around the throne and he, and he, and he sees, um, it says in ver, uh, chapter five, John writes, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written and on the back a sealed with seven seals and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scrolls and to break the seals? And no one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And then one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the throne. And between the throne and the four living creatures and along the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And they were singing a new song saying, worthy are you to open the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every nation. And you made them a kingdom of priests to God and they shall reign on earth. And then I looked and I heard that around the throne and the living creatures and the elders a voice of many angels numbering myriads upon myriads, thousands upon thousands, saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and and blessing. And I heard every creature, listen, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and the seas saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That's what's going on in heaven right now. The lamb has overcome you understand that? Later on it says that behold, there's a great multitude of, of, of heaven and earth before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. And therefore before the gro- throne of God, he, John says that they serve him night and, dead in his tem- night and day in his temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And then he goes on in verse 16 of chapter 7. They shall hunger no more, neither there shall they thirst no more. The sh- sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every every tear from their eyes. You understand, when we sing, forever you are glorified, forever you are lifted high, we sing, hallelujah, the lamb has overcome. It isn't words in a song, it's a reality of what is happening in heaven and on earth right now, whether we choose to recognize it or not. And last week, as we began this series about praying like Jesus, how do we pray like Jesus? I began by explaining to you that our prayers are informed by, how, by us knowing who it is that we approach, right? And who do we approach? We approach Jesus, the Lamb, the one who has <laughs> myriads and upon myriads around the throne, <laughs> blessing and honor and glory forever and ever. That's, that's who it is. Folks, don't ever, let's, let's not, pull my grace, whether you're online or here, don't ever let this just be a Sunday where we come in and go through the motions. We are joining with angels. This is a reality. This is not a storybook. And we have a promise in this word of what is happening and what will happen. And it is everything to do with how we approach this thing called prayer. This is, this is the week number two. Last week we talked about approaching God and saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? And today we're gonna go on in Matthew chapter six, if you wanna turn there. Today we're gonna talk about this next section. 
which says, thy kingdom come. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus asked us to pray about this thing called the kingdom. If you weren't here last week, I said that at one point during his ministry, Jesus was doing ministry, and in Matthew we have it during a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and his disciples came to him, and they said to him something that may seem just to be a kind of a harmless thing or an obvious thing, but it necessarily wasn't at the time. They said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And and a rabbi teaching his disciples how to pray wasn't revolutionary, but it was how Jesus taught them to pray that was revolutionary. And if you're like me, maybe you've struggled with prayer. Maybe you've struggled with your effectiveness of prayer. Maybe if you're like me, you fall asleep when you try to pray. Maybe your mind wonders when you try to pray. Maybe you've had seasons where you don't even know if you're doing it right. Maybe you've had times, can I say this as a pastor? I will anyway. Where it's boring, right? I've been there. But it's, it's a gift from God. It's this amazing thing. And I think if we can just understand Jesus' answer, that it can open up our prayer life to something new, something rich, something inviting. And that's my prayer for us, even as we talk about this today. And as we see in Matthew 6, chapter 10, Jesus says, we are to pray your kingdom come. Pray to God, your God, your kingdom come. Now, in the Bible, it's not just important enough to talk about what is said. We also have to talk about how it's said. Okay, now I'm going to warn you this morning, if you're, new, if you're new here, I want to explain this to you too. I do the best that I can as, as a man each and every week to make my sermons as practical as possible and as relevant as possible. Today's sermon is going to be pretty theologically dense, okay? I'm going to be doing some teaching today, and I don't want you, so if you, if you, if you get lost in that, really get yourself ready, because here's the deal. I wrestled with whether to bring this or not, but I believe an understanding theologically of the kingdom come is so important to our prayers that I want to make sure we address this. And I have to address it in a way which is going to be getting a little bit in the weeds more than I usually do, okay? So hang with me, though, because I really believe this is going to help, okay? I really do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here, okay? So how your kingdom come is said is as important as what is said. Because, you know, in the New Testament, our New Testament is translated from the Greek language. And those of us that didn't pay attention in seventh grade English didn't pay attention to tenses. We didn't pay attention to to language and the way it works. And so when I talk about the Greek language, you don't have any any idea what I'm talking about. I didn't either until I had to to for a grade. So it's okay. But your kingdom come is in the imperative mood in Greek and in the passive tense. Now, what does that mean? The imperative mood means it's a command, okay? So that means you could literally translate that, that Jesus told us to pray, come your kingdom. It's not supposed to be, your kingdom come. No, come your kingdom, right? Come, 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 Lord, come the kingdom of God, come, right? And this command is not, now don't hear me, it's in the passive tense. So it's not like we are giving God a command. If I were to tell you that we're supposed to give God commands, you should probably find a new pastor. It doesn't work well, right? We're not supposed supposed to command God. The passive tense means like a child would go to his father and know that whatever they ask, they believe the father can do. We are going to God and we are saying, come your kingdom. Not because we're commanding him, but because we are in line with the reality that at any moment, at any time, his kingdom could come. You with me? And he said we're supposed to pray like that. So what is the kingdom? That's the question. What does it mean to say the kingdom come? What is this thing called kingdom? In the Western world, we think of the kingdom uh, through the lens of like kings and queens, right? And the kingdom of England, and they have rulership over a geographic region. 
and everybody's subject to them. And that's, that's a good picture. But the reality is, is the kingdom of God is that but so much more. What is the kingdom of God? It is the dynamic reign of God over heaven and earth in all things visible and invisible. It's everywhere. It's over everything at all times. That's what the kingdom of God is. And it was the message of Jesus. It was what Jesus talked about. It is what Jesus embodied was the kingdom. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is the king of a kingdom which is not of this world. It is a place where God rule and reign, rules and reigns over everything else. Everything. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first four books of the New Testament, we see the kingdom of God mentioned over a hundred times. It was that big of a deal to Jesus' message. And in Matthew, he called it the kingdom of heaven. And in Luke and Mark, he called it the kingdom of God. But he talked about it in his parables. He talked about it in his message. And as you're going to see, he talked about it a lot of places. And they both mean the exact same thing. God's rule and reign. And so when Jesus says, you and I are supposed to pray that your kingdom would come, not just pray, but with the imperative mood, right? In the passive tense, we go and we say, God, may your kingdom come. We are saying that we are praying and asking God that he would intervene in the history of humankind. We are saying to him, come and break in to the course of history right now. May you come. We are saying, God, have your way throughout the entire earth, in all areas, in every place, in every way. We are saying when inside of us we are hurt and when we know that things are not as they should be and we are weeping or we are crying or we are anxious or we are worried and we know that this would not be the way it would be if God had his way, then we are to take that and take it to him and say, Lord, have your way. And here's the reality of this. God is king whether we acknowledge it or not. He is. This is a little pet peeve of mine. It's not really in the notes, but I'll share it anyway. I, I, yeah, I will. I, I have the mic. This is the danger. Um, when people say, and we say it in church, I've even said it. When we tell people when, they, when we came to Christ that I made Jesus my Lord and Savior, our theology is terrible. God doesn't need you to make him anything. He is king, he is Lord, he is savior. Maybe you realized it, you were drawn to him, you bowed and surrendered your life to him, and that's what you did. I surrendered to Jesus as Lord and king of the world and savior of my sins. And you, he is the king and he is reigning and he is here. And he is able to do whatever we call upon him. And Jesus asked us to pray that his kingdom would come. Whew. Now, historically, theologians have argued about this and what this means. And some of you, after I'm done with this message, you're going to argue with me about what this means. Because some people say this. Some people say that the kingdom of God, his rule and reign, is fully present right here on earth right now. Right? Right? It's here, and God can have his way, and, 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 and the reality is, the implication is, is if he isn't having his way, then there's something wrong with us, okay? We'll talk a little bit about that more later, and I'll, I'll tease this out a little bit more. Other people say something different. They say the kingdom of God isn't present at all, and God isn't in, have the ability to rule and reign at all. In fact, we're all just here and we got to struggle with the way things are and our prayer for the kingdom to come is that Jesus would come back and that's all it means. That he would come back and he would save us from this place, right? And we have these two opposite sides and I would respectfully say to many theologians that they're both wrong and I would say that I have found in my studies that a best way to understand this is also many theologians, so don't think I'm making this up, <laughs> um, that our understanding is that when we say that your kingdom come, that we are praying to God that it would come because we understand that it, the kingdom is here already, but it's not yet. Okay? 
It's already, but not yet. Now, what do I mean by this? That's why you're all here this morning, right? So what does it mean with, when, when we say the kingdom's already? It means that when Jesus came to earth through his message and through his ministry, something happened in human history where God broke in in a brand new way and did something that had not yet been done and through Jesus Christ and his ministry, the kingdom was inaugurated. Could be called, could be, could be actually referenced like he brought it in with him, okay? Like it, it changed things. Can we all agree Jesus changed things on earth, okay? That's all, that's all I'm trying to say, okay? And this is how we know, because he told us. It's amazing, right? When Jesus grew up as a little car- a carpenter's son, and he, and he grew up, and he, wa- he grew up as a young man, and then one day he walked into the synagogue, and somebody handed him a scroll, and he opened it up, and the reading of, from that day was Isaiah 61, and in Luke 4, 18 to 19, we see that he read these words. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set, liber- set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus was declaring the long last, lost year of Jubilee. He was declaring he was the king and he was declaring by his presence on earth that it had begun. And you know what they did to him? They tried to kill him. Because he said, this has come true in your hearing today. And they didn't like it. In, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus walks in the scene. I've shared this before. First red letters, if you have a red letter Bible. Jesus walks in on Mark chapter 1 verses 15 and he says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What do you, how do you respond? You repent and believe in this gospel. You repent and believe that there is good news coming with me, that the kingdom of God, God's rule and reign is at hand. That's what he's saying. And, so he, and then through his ministry, <coughs> he does it. He would demonstrate in kingdom, the kingdom in his signs and in wonders in the transformation of every single human life that he touched. So much so that he, as he went about his ministry, it wasn't yet fully here though, right? It was already there, but it wasn't fully there, and that confused some people. One of the people he confused was John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was in prison. He was about to lose his head, figuratively and literally, okay? Come on, guys, and help a guy out, right? He's about to lose his head, and, uh, and he says, okay, wait, if, you're the, if the kingdom's here, then, then, then what's going on? Like, why isn't everything as it should be? Why isn't God in charge? Why aren't you overthrowing Rome? All of these things, right? And Jesus says to the disciples who John sends to Jesus, he says to them, Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see, that the blind receive their sight. See here, hark back to Isaiah 61. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. In other words, the kingdom has come. Okay? And the Pharisees didn't believe this. They didn't like it. They actually accused Jesus of doing everything he did based upon the power of the devil rather than the power of God. In one place, they called him, said that he cast out demons by the power of the devil or Beelzebub, okay? And look what Jesus' answer was to them in Matthew, Matthew 12, 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He didn't make this very hard for us to understand, right? Like, he began something new. The kingdom was here, and it was his message. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Look at Luke 4.43. Like I said, there's over 100 times, right, that this is mentioned. We're not going to go through all 100 because you want to go home and eat, all right? But Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God uh, to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose to usher in God's rule and reign to change the course of history through who he was and what he did and he made this a priority not only did he make it as a priority but in the same message that he teaches us to pray the sermon on the mount he tells us that it's supposed to be a priority for us in our ministry and in our life and it's certainly in our prayers he goes as far as in uh, in Luke to tell us that uh, if we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. 
It's supposed to be the target for our lives to seek the kingdom of God. You with me so far? This is what Jesus said. And then after he taught it, and after he demonstrated it, and after he, they walked with him for a while, then he sent the 12 disciples out to do the same thing. He says in Luke 9, he says this, Then he called the twelve together, and they, he gave them power and authority over all dem- demons and a cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. This is what Jesus said. This is what he did. This was the core of what he was. And then, by his resurrection from the dead, he verified to everyone that he was king. That he destroyed the power of sin over human hearts. That he destroyed the power of Satan in the world. That he destroyed the power of death itself once and for all. Because when he rose from the dead, he not only died on the cross for all of those things to be defeated, all of those powers to be dethroned, all of those things to lose their grip on us. But then he rose from the dead and was. the Bible says he is the first of the brand new kingdom and the first of all of those who are born from the dead or born again. You with me so far? We are kingdom people because of what Jesus did. Jesus inaugurated the rule and reign of God on earth. We are part of that. We are citizens of that. And his purposes in the world since creation and from the fall would begin to be realized through Jesus. The the kingdom is already So when we pray for the kingdom to come and we pray for the kingdom, for his will to be done, we understand this. Listen, every sinner who admits their need for a savior, God's kingdom has come. Every physical healing, God's kingdom has come. Every act of forgiveness, God's kingdom has come. God's kingdom has come. Every action addressing poverty, God's kingdom has come. Every person that's delivered from demonic oppression, God's kingdom has come. Every reconciled marriage, God's kingdom has come. Every time we see things happen on earth as God would want them to be, God's kingdom has come. That's what it means. But the kingdom is already and not yet. Why is it not yet? Because it's a foretaste. What we see, when we see God move, it's just a foretaste that God's kingdom will come fully one day. Because it's not yet here. Yes, God's kingdom broke in through Jesus. Yes, we see him move. I can't, if I went around the room, I bet we have all seen God rule and reign, God's rule and reign come come to life in our lives one way or another. And yet we also can attest that it doesn't always happen, that we still see evil, we still see brokenness, but we know that one day, because of what I just read, that it will come fully, but it's not yet here. And scripture talks about that too. Yes, we still have human suffering and pain. Difficulty has not completely disappeared. It's with us today. Jesus talked about this too. This is what's so difficult to understand. One, one example, just one example, was with the rich young ruler. You know, the guy that came to Jesus, and he said to Jesus, how can I have entrance into the kingdom of God? Right? Jesus told him, go sell everything you have. Right? Guy walks away, pretty heartbroken, because Scripture tells us he had a lot of wealth. And Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. This is a little confusing because if Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is at hand, then where do people have to enter into, right? It's because there's going to be a fuller presence of this one day. We know that. We know one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to establish his kingdom. And then God is going to come back, and he is going to make all things new, and we have to, there's a not yet part of this. You're still with me, everybody. It's both. We know that God's kingdom is not fully here through Jesus, because if it was fully here through Jesus, then things would be as God wants them. And Paul, shortly after Jesus' ascension, tells us that things still aren't as they should be. And we know that from our own lives, but let's look at a few examples in Galatians 1. Paul says, grace and peace to you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and Father. 
So our age, how we live, our world right now, our world during Paul is still evil. There's still evil existing. Duh, we know that, right? Go on, Ephesians 2, Paul writes again, you and I, those who, the, the people he's writing to, who at one point did not believe in God, did not surrender to Christ as Lord, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins in which you watched, walk, once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So the reality is, though the kingdom has come, people are still walking in the way of a world that's fallen. People are still walking in the way of the prince of the air. Satan is still at work, and he is bringing about disobedience in the hearts of men. That's what Satan's doing. So yes, Jesus dethroned him. Yes, he destroyed the power of Satan on the cross, but it's not yet fully here. It's tough. Then Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. But behold, I tell you a mystery. I have a, I have a dream, by the way, that, this is a, that, that I'll, I'll be reading this passage one day, and it'll actually happen as I'm reading it. <laughs> I would just love that. But anyway, uh, get ready. Behold, I tell you a great mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Yes, then the kingdom will have fully come, but in the middle of it, it is already and not yet. But Jesus says we pray for his kingdom to come. Let's, talk, let's set that aside for a second. We'll come back to that. But he also says that we have to pray, your will be done. Your Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. And it, praying for his will to be done cannot be separated from the kingdom, but praying that his kingdom come cannot be separated from his will. You with, you with me on that? I'll say that again. Praying that his kingdom come cannot be separated from his will. It's that important. Because we cannot pray for something that is not God's will. Or, or if we choose to pray for his kingdom to come, but we don't yet recognize that his will should be done through the way that his kingdom comes, then we cease to be making him Lord, and instead we're making ourselves Lord. Right? Right? We, we cease to say, Lord, this is the desire that I have and, ra- and, and make it so rather than actually understanding that it's about his will and desires in our heart. Jesus modeled this for us the night before he died. In Matthew 26, it says, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So in a bold, once again, this verse, your will be done, is an imperative in the passive tense. So in a bold way, we say, God, your will be done. Your will be done in this issue, even if it contradicts my will. Your will be done. And here's the thing. I believe that if we pray for God's kingdom to come because we want things to happen that should be because the way that they are is not the way that they should be if God was in charge, right? That's what we're praying when we're praying for his kingdom to come. As we pray for his will to be done, we pray with faith that his will will be done. And as we pray with faith that his kingdom come and his will will be done, the reality is not whether or not it will happen, it's whether or not it will happen already or not yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because because here's the deal. Let me make this really clear. Let's talk about somebody's physical healing, somebody who has cancer. I believe when I pray for for a fellow, for a sister or brother in Christ who is suffering with cancer, when I pray for their healing, I am fully praying that God would break in and that his kingdom would come and that they would be healed. But as I'm praying that, I also recognize that God's will is that they will be healed because there is no cancer in heaven. There will not be any cancer in heaven. So I know that that's his will. So as I say that his will be done, I am praying with faith that it will happen already, but I am trusting 100% that it will happen, but it may be not yet. 
And what happens on the other side of my amen is not determined by God's answer to my prayer. It's determined by my faith in his will and character and the power of his kingdom. And we must understand that as we pray that his kingdom come and his will be done. And understanding this is the capacity to, under, to eagerly desire the will of God and be done in any circumstance. And praying with God's kingdom yet understanding his will is what sets apart Christian prayer from magic. It's what sets apart Christian prayer, faithful prayer, from people that just choose to distort the teachings of Jesus Christ, that it become, praying for people, becomes a magic trick or some kind of show of our authority and power. What I, let, me, let me read this. Magic manipulates spiritual powers to see our own will accomplished. True prayer, Christian prayer, biblical prayer, however, yields ourselves to a greater will even as we make our requests in faith born from our own preferences. Prayer in the end is about God's will being done. And we have to hold these intentions. This is not an easy topic, but this is what it means to pray. So we pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I think this part in of itself throws away the idea that, that when we pray, oh, well, that's not until Jesus comes back, okay? It's saying we're praying right now, God. The way things, the reality of what it would be in heaven, we are praying that heaven would come to earth and that you would break in, in this area, in this problem, in this situation, Church, in order for us to live out our mission in the world that God has given us, we must embrace this tension. We must pray that God would manifest on earth. If, if you don't believe that when you pray for something to happen because it's not as God would will it, if God was in charge of everything, then you, and you don't believe that it could happen, then what's the point of praying? We pray with faith. 100% faith. We believe that God's kingdom can invade the situations we're praying for. But we also realize, that's the already, but we also realize that not everyone will experience God's love or God's power the way we want them to when we want it. That's the not yet part of it. We pray that when, when, one, when one person gets healed, we rejoice in the miracle of God. That's the already. But we also have grieved that a, when a person succumbs to the effects of cancer. That's the not yet. It's a tension. It's something we have to live with. And here's the thing. Christian people respond to this tension usually from rather than living in the tension because we don't like that. We want life to be black and white. So we respond in one of two ways. We either, what's called over-realized eschatology, we, re, we, we actually believe, well, God's kingdom's fully here. And God can do it whenever he wants. And, and it, it's not that, that there's a dynamic at play right now where God is present in that work, but yet God hasn't fully given the world over to God fully. And so there's still powers and principalities and things that work in this world. Death is still present. Sin is still present. We don't like that tension. And we just say there's an over-realized eschatology. The kingdom of God's here. God will do it every time you pray. And therefore, if something doesn't happen when you pray, that means that you're, you're the problem, that you don't have faith, and you didn't, you didn't pray the right way. That's how some people solve the tension. Have you ever been in a church that says that? Well, you, you, God didn't answer your prayer. I don't know. You must have sin in your life or some kind of, you know, some kind of issue or you don't have enough faith. That's how some people handle the tension. And then there's other people that have an unrealized eschatology that says, you know, God doesn't do anything like that anymore. God doesn't do miracles. He doesn't, he doesn't work that way. He doesn't answer prayers that way anymore. And, and, and prayer, prayer in, in, in my opinion, I'll lovingly say that, is, is neutered through that, through that viewpoint. I don't think Jesus would tell us to pray this way if that was the truth. So we have to live in this tension. I believe scripture speaks to both. And so this is what I believe. It means to faithfully pray that his kingdom would come and his will to be done. It means that we pray with faith in the already while trusting in the not yet. 
We pray with faith in the already. We pray and we believe. I believe that when I pray for a situation, I believe that God can answer the prayer right then. When I get on my knees in the morning and I pray that the coronavirus would leave this world, so A, we could go back to normal, but B, most importantly, so that people don't continue to die, because 160,000, regardless of where you come down on the coronavirus, is a heartbreaking number. And I pray that it would leave this world. When I pray that, I believe that my Lord in heaven can snap his fingers and it will be gone right now. But I also believe and trust that there's a place and a time when God brings his kingdom in fully where there will be nothing, even no coronavirus, but no viruses at all. And my faith is fully trusting in that reality. And as I pray that his will would be done, I know that if the coronavirus is gone the moment I say amen, or the coronavirus is gone the moment Jesus comes back, either way I win. And either way, my God is powerful and he is rich, his riches and glory are bestowed upon me and my faith isn't about my momentary circumstances. My faith is rooted in a savior who ushered in a kingdom and a book that, of his word that he has given us that promises that that kingdom is promised and that one day I will hear the words, behold, I make all things new and every prayer that I answer according to the will of God will come as it was asked. And from that place, I am praying with faith in the already, but I'm trusting, I'm rooted in the not yet. And so I can pray, folks. I can pray, and I do pray in my prayers. I pray, come, your kingdom, come. I pray it. I pray it for every area, for every relationship, for everything I could possibly think of. And this isn't new to me. This isn't new to me. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, maybe you never heard of it, but they actually, this catechism goes through all of the prayers. This is what it says. It says, when we pray that God's kingdom would come, we pray that Satan's kingdom would be destroyed. We pray that the kingdom of grace may be advanced. Ourselves and others would be brought in it and kept in it. That's the already. We pray for that, and that we pray that the, glory, the kingdom of glory would be hastened. We both pray that God would come in the already, but we also pray that that part about when he's going to come once and for all, we pray that that would happen too. So when we say, come your kingdom, we say, come your kingdom now, or come your kingdom. Either way, we have faith in you to move, and we pray for that. And we pray, when I pray that I pray, not, your, not my will, but yours though, Lord. And I'm going to step on some toes here for a second. Praying not my will, but yours, even if it can contradicts our will, is not permission for us to have no faith. I have heard Christians, well-meaning Christians, pray, not our will, but yours, Lord. And rather than it be from a position of faith, it comes out to me more as if they're giving permission for God not to move. I don't believe enough in the fact that God could come in the already, so I'm going to give him an out in my prayer so I can save face. You've all heard people say it. We've all prayed it before. I've prayed like that before. That's not what it means. When we're praying under God's will, we are still to pray with hope And we're still to pray with faith. Eugene Peterson in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, I think says it the best, better than I could. He says, hoping does not mean doing nothing and it is not fatalistic resignation. And that's sometimes what we do when we say, not my will but yours, Lord. We're like, I'm I'm, I'm gonna pray for this thing, but I don't even believe it's gonna happen right? That's, he says that's not what it is. Hope means a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he say he w- says he will do. It's the imagination put in the harness of faith, and it is a willingness to let God do it his way and in his time. That's what it means to pray in God's will. So I'm going to pray, come your kingdom. I'm going to pray, not my will, but yours, but I'm going to pray for heaven to meet earth. I'm committed, folks, as your pastor, I am committed to pray and live in the tension of the already but not yet. 
And so you may hear me pray this sometime. If you've ever been with me when I've anointed somebody and prayed for them, I will say, there's many applications to this, but healing sometimes the easiest one. I will pray, God, I know that cancer does not exist in heaven. And so I am praying as your son that you would heal this brother or sister or this person in Jesus' name. Come, make your rule and reign over all things known right now. I'm going to glorify you regardless. But boy, Lord, I'd love to see it happen in the already. But I have faith and trust in the not yet because I know that even those that are healed on earth will die but I know that the real promise is that we're all going to be imperishable if we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ right and so I can pray with that with faith I can pray with faith in the already while trusting in the not yet and I folks if you've struggled with having faith to pray for things that are big or someone's told you at one point that's not good enough anymore, or you've prayed for things that are big and you haven't seen God move and you've been heartbroken, I will tell you scripture has an answer. It's the fact that you and I are in between Jesus coming and starting his kingdom presence in the world, but we are still waiting for the kingdom to fully come. And while we live in that tension, sometimes God breaks in in the already, but sometimes it's a not yet situation, but yet our faith is rooted and trusted in a God who's still Lord and powerful over it all, who is a father that loves us, and understanding that sometimes there's not answers to prayer under our will does not mean that it's not God's will. And just because we see God's will happen in ways we don't want to doesn't give us permission to stop praying for his kingdom to come. It's a tension. It's hard. I hope this is making sense. So this is what it looks like. This looks like me, praying my father, daddy, your son's here, and I love you, and I'm just coming to you, and I just want to praise your name, I want to glorify your name, I want to join with the saints and angels and hallow your name, blessing and glory and honor to you forever and ever, you are a holy God, you are holy, I am not, and in your presence I am made small, but yet I know as your son that you have elevated me to a place I never deserved because of your grace, and as, as your son, I confidently approach the throne of grace because of what your son Jesus has done for me, what my big brother's done for me, and I come to you, Lord, and I pray that your kingdom would come in these areas. I pray that no more family or friends would deny that their need for you, Lord. And I pray that, they would come, that it would come. I pray that your kingdom would come. And Lord, I pray that you would free every innocent child from sex trafficking and that your kingdom would come right now and that it would be no more. And Lord, I pray that sickness and abuse and cancer, and racism, and poverty, and corrupt systems would all be gone in this world. In Jesus' name, kingdom come in these areas. And God, I pray that the corruption in our government and the, the idea in our Supreme Court that it's more important for people to go to a casino than the house of the Lord of all creation would go and that your kingdom would come in Jesus' name. And I pray that as we think about, Lord, this week, that about Hiroshima and, and Nasasaki and the A-bomb being dropped, Lord, I would pray that every single war would cease, that every single use of a weapon would cease, that, that, that our... That our that our uh, sores would be beat into plowshares because that is not part of what your kingdom is. And that I pray, Lord, for peace on earth and that your kingdom would come and that your will would be de done. I pray, Lord, and I know, Lord, and I pray for, I for, pray for my, my brother Aaron who, who is facing surgery on Friday. And Lord, I know that there is no cancer in heaven. And Lord, I pray for his surgery and I pray for his surgeons. But even so, Lord, I pray that your kingdom would come and that, that when he would go into surgery, 
surgery, they wouldn't even find cancer because you've already healed it. In Jesus' name, I pray for your kingdom to come, and I pray for your will to be done, and I know that I will not always see the results I want in heaven, but in the meantime, God, I am praying in, pray, praying to you, and I am trusting in you, and my hope is in you, and I am going to pray the way that, your Lord, that my Lord taught me to pray, that your kingdom would come, and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And before I get off my knees and say amen, I ask that his kingdom would begin in me. And that I would live my life the way that he's called me to. And that I would live as the son and the citizen of, ke- of heaven that he's called me to live. And guess what? Praying that it would happen in me is what the rest of this prayer is about. So we're going to get there. But we're called, folks. We're called as the church of God who lives out the mission of God to pray with faith, believing that God can move, believing that God is real, believing that his kingdom can come in the world through the people of God who believe in his power and presence. But we're to do it while trusting in the not yet because our faith isn't rooted on the other side of the amen. Our faith is rooted in his word who has promised he will return. And and therefore, they are all before the throne of God. Right now, they serve him day and night, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. And the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to living the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And from that place, I pray. I hope this makes sense. So this week, powerfully, faithfully, get on your knees and pray with faith in the already present, powerful, kingdom of God because God is king and his rule and reign is in all the earth and in everything visible and invisible whether people in this world recognize it or not as his followers as his sons and daughters we do but also recognize that his will may be that we don't see it happen and as we see those things and as we grieve the not yet part of the kingdom our faith is rooted in the reality that the not yet is not never You with me? This will change your prayers. Understanding this will change your prayers. And you'll begin, I believe, to pray like Jesus. Amen? All right. I love you all. I hope you have a good week. I really do. I hope this, if you have some questions, concerns, comments, come find me. I'd love to talk about this. This is, I just took four volumes of theology and put it into 45 minutes. I hope it made sense. But God bless you all. Pray with faith this week. And let's give God the glory and honor. Amen. See ya. And you online, thanks for joining us. Uh, Let us know you were here with I Was Here, and we'll see you next week.